Welcome, brothers and sisters, to another episode of the Branches of Yahusha show. We are here today with Sister Phyllis, um, and we are going to be speaking with Lucinda Robinson, who is a herbalist and uh, mother, grandmother, uh, homeschooler, home birther, a bit of everything. She's done a lot of studying, and we're going to chat today with her um, about her experiences and, and her, her story and her life. How are you, sister? Oh, I'm fine. I'm, it's been a wonderful morning, and I'm excited to get to see. I've never done a three-way, and I'm really exci- excited and blessed. How are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. I'm, I'm very excited as well. I've had a little look at um, Lucinda's uh, biography, and I'm very excited to, to talk to her and hear everything that she has to, t- to share today. So we'll bring her in. Oh, Thanks, here yeah. we go. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well. And you? Yes, very good. Good morning, Lucinda. Good morning. Very excited to talk with you this morning. So I hope I hope it's not too early for you. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. What a wonderful opportunity! Thinking that we're in three different places on Earth. <laughs> I know it's incredible, isn't it? The the um, internet and and its capabilities these days. Yes, it is. It's wonderful. Well, it's finally wonderful to, to meet you, Lucinda. I've known you for a long time, but I've never talked to you face to face. This is a blessing. It is for me, too. I was able to watch a few of the videos that you had previously posted, so I feel like I know you a little bit better, too, Phyllis, just from watching that. Mm-hmm. I have an interesting conversion story as well as what I've done in my life. Well, that would be so. wonderful to hear. Let's start with that, then. We'd love to hear that. Well, do we start now? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, um, I was in, born into an Episcopal family, family, and my story of how I was converted is quite uh, well intertwined with my father's story because my father was a very successful businessman, and he said his whole life he wanted to read the Bible. And finally, he came to a point where he started reading the Bible. And when he did that, he found out that many things that he thought was part of a religious Christian life actually wasn't even in the Bible. And uh, he understood things like the Sabbath and uh, that a lot of the holidays that he was celebrating weren't even mentioned in the Bible. And not only that, a lot of them had a lot of pagan connotations to them. So he started making changes and he wanted my mother to make changes also and she did not want to make the changes. So they separated over uh, the issue of religion and during the time that my parents were separated of course my father had the opportunity to uh, have visiting rights with the children and he would often talk to me about the new things he was learning on these visiting times about the scripture and it all sounded very foreign to me and I was just a child about 10 years old but I noticed that my dad was very happy you know and he was very peaceful and calm and some of his bad habits that he'd had in the past he had done away with like drinking and smoking and having um, uh, anger bouts of anger and so forth he just seemed like a different person to me than what I had observed in our home so over time uh, you know he basically what we would call witnessed to me of different things from the scripture and when I was about 16 years old in 1967 and I remember it very specifically he said to me Jesus Christ is going to return in your lifetime and my mother was telling people that my dad had actually gone crazy that you know he had started doing all these very strange things and for my dad to stand up for the things that he did, he did not know one other person in our community who understood these things, except for one man who happened to live right across the street, who was a, an avid follower of Herbert W. Armstrong. So they would have discussions, and they were a support basically for each other. Well, when he said that to me, that Jesus Christ is going to return during your lifetime, I said to myself as a 16 year old, either my dad is really crazy because Jesus has already come once, why does he have to come again? Or this is something I need to find out about. 
And from that point on, I decided that I was going to read the scriptures for myself. So I sat down one day in the kitchen of our house, and my, as I said, my dad was living in a separate dwelling at that point. My mother was there. And I told my mother, all of these people are telling me all these things about what the Bible says, but I've never read it for myself. So today I'm starting. I'm going to read it for myself. And uh, I believe that there was probably spirits aggravating my mother because within a few days she told me she was going to kill me. And she had different violence uh, bouts against me from the time that I started reading the scripture. One time she, I was talking to her about the scripture and what I was reading, and it felt like there was a wall of fire all the way around me as she was verbally attacking me. And I, I, I'll never forget the experience that you know I felt protected from what she was throwing at me. Um, as time went on, when I was 18, I gave my life to the Heavenly Father, and I understood that this world alone is not worth living for. And our family was uh, very worldly. They loved the holidays. It was very important. They loved uh, money. They loved influence. They loved everything that had to do with the world. And I was so blessed to be able to, uh, at that point, get into Cornell University to go to college. and. Uh, I had a, a wonderful experience there, and then uh, after I left there, I found, met my husband, who was a Sabbath keeper in the Church of God Seventh Day, and he was going to be in the ministry. So we uh, married and ended up having eight beautiful children, and I homeschooled, I home birthed seven of my children. Uh, we ate natural foods as far as we knew. They, they weren't called organic then, they were called natural foods. And just had many, many wonderful experiences of faith. One thing that uh, we did for three years, we were on a total faith ministry in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And I could literally write a book and plan on doing it of the things that happened to us during that time, how we were provided for, and how food and clothing would come like clockwork when we would pray when we didn't have the actual money to buy the things. And it was just a marvelous, marvelous experience to see how if you're destitute and desperate and come to the Heavenly Father for every single little need He will provide. Um, one time I remember praying for a size 12 navy blue button-up sweater for one of my children. And within a day or two, it came to the front door in a black plastic bag. Someone just left clothes on our doorstep and inside there, was a navy blue size 12 button-up sweater. Another time our son needed size 10 sneakers and I remember specifically praying for size 10 sneakers and a brand new pair came to the front door in a black plastic bag from somebody and I don't even remember who it was uh, you know for him and another time we had we owed $98 on our insurance on our car and we had a van because at that point we had six children and we couldn't take them or get groceries or anything and if the insurance ran out my husband being the upright man that he is wouldn't drive it without insurance and it was very interesting that that, that day there was uh, we went to check the mail and there was an envelope in the mailbox with a hundred dollar bill and all it said on it was thank Jesus and through all of this we never told anybody what we needed we just prayed about it because we were not we were determined that we were not going to beg or influence anybody or make them feel sorry for us we just said we're going to pray about every need so we, we've had some very wonderful experiences and and more some lovely lovely experiences through the years when I first started reading the Bible I remember going through it the first time and and I said you know this is such a beautiful book and it it shows you how to get God's interaction into your life. And I saw how much God loved us as individuals. I never understood that before. That He loves us as individuals. He wants to interact in every minute detail of our life if we'll let Him. And that He had these extra bonus points in life for people called blessings if we would obey. And it was uh, struck on me immediately that you know, I have to get my life in line with what the scripture says if I want to even have the audacity to come before God and ask Him to help me in any way. 
because I saw that he had a severe side, but he also had a very loving and compassionate side, and that we were supposed to follow what he said, and if we did that, then he would definitely be with us in every way. So I endeavored to do that. I started reading the second time through the scriptures, and I just said, okay, I need to change this. I need to make adjustments. I need to start doing this. I need to stop doing this because, you know, whatever it was, the adjustments. And immediately I saw, I feel miraculous things happening. He gave me, even in high school, when I just decided that I was going to give my life to him, he started giving me a discernment of people's motives. And it turned out that he would sort of reveal it to me through wisdom and through understanding and it would turn out later you would find out that was exactly the person's reason for doing it although you didn't see it on the surface later it would be revealed he uh, I, several people I prayed for to be healed of things were instantaneously healed and that lasted for a while it didn't last forever but it was a uh, an indication to me that you know he had power he was with me and that to keep going, it was like the carrot before the horse, keep going, keep going, you're going in the right direction. At the same time, I was having a lot of people around me persecuting me. My mother made me go to two different pastors and talk with them, and they were supposed to straighten me out, so to speak. And I don't, it was a miracle. The Heavenly Father gave me verses to discuss with them and to ask them questions on, and they couldn't answer my questions. And they ended up that, you know, they had no fight against me when the discussion was over. I mean, it was just so many things had happened through the years that he took care of me and gave me wisdom, gave me the words, and gave me the strength. And I had completely determined, even when I was at Cornell, my sisters told me the right fraternities to date and all of these type of things. And I was determined just to keep myself clean and keep myself pure and seek out true-hearted people. Another thing happened through all of this that from the time I was uh, 18, I always felt I was Jewish. And it was a very strange feeling, but it was always on my, it's almost like something was on my head or on my shoulders. I felt this thing, I was Jewish. I met a lot of Jewish friends. I was asked in Cornell to be become a member of the Jewish sorority, and they never asked Gentile girls to join it, but they asked me to. And many other experiences I had in life, there were Jewish boys who wanted to date me, and some of my best friends were Jewish people. And uh, I've written a, an article, actually, on all of these encounters I had, and, and yet I never knew I was Jewish or never um, had it confirmed. My dad said to me one time, he said, you know, it is possible that we're Jewish in background. So in uh, several years ago, I actually had DNA, DNA testing because it had sort of nagged at me for years. Am I or am I not? Not that it really matters, but I wanted to know for myself, why have I always felt this way? And it, uh, I did have the DNA testing, and I had two of the three markers necessary for Jewish ancestry. So I thought that was very interesting, that he had driven me all these years to believe that, and it made me cling to the scriptures even more, because I understood that there's a reason why uh, he would, you know, attach me so much to the scriptures, especially calling me. I felt I was called in 1967, which, as we know, was when the rest, uh, Western Wall was uh, captured and probably the time of the Gentiles might have been fulfilled at that time. And since that time, of course, there's been a huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit convicting and drawing uh, the Jewish people to the Messiah. Um, during this time, too, I started an interest in, uh, after reading the scriptures, uh, I wanted to learn more about natural health and the verse about uh, herbs being for the um, healing of the nations. It just caught my attention, and I started reading everything I could on uh, herbal, herbal <laughs> healing. And my focus has always been on what do the herbs do. Of course, I've learned many other things in conjunction with this that has to do with natural healing. Anything that's non-invasive or organic, uh, I, I've been very interested in, along with um, organic gardening and organic agriculture. And uh, 
it developed over time into an actual counseling service that I have now. And I've spoken to people from all over the world and all over the United States and Canada and had some very rare opportunities to learn things that uh, uh, some doctors don't even know. And I remember praying different times to know the answers to certain things. Like I wanted to know what causes cancer. And I, I prayed about it, asked the Heavenly Father because I said they're doing all this research and for some reason they can't really come up with the actual cause. Well, uh, not long after that I walked into our public library and there were six books on the shelf called The Conquest of Cancer by Dr. Virginia Livingston Wheeler of the Livingston Wheeler uh, Cancer and Immunological Clinic out in uh, California, in San Diego. And I read that book and she actually defined the cause of cancer and since that time I've gotten a lot of other research confirming her research where others had discovered this exact same thing that she discovered and yet it never gets out into the mainstream media and the mainstream news and I started at that point treating all of the patients who came to me and I really shouldn't call them patients, clients, uh, treating them uh, using her information and uh, many of the uh, the clients would get well within six to eight weeks of using her protocols. Other things that I learned over the years were from Dr. Hulda Clark and Max Gerson, Mr. Hoxie. I mean there's so many people who have uh, discovered different elements of how to cure cancer and it's very simple to cure it if you know how to do it and if you know the steps that you have to take to do it because there's a certain order of cleanses and uh, you have to get rid of parasites first then bacteria then uh, any fungi and then and then you have to work on chemical pollutants because the parasites are the strongest member of this bonding of all of these ingredients and you have to get rid of the stronger members in succession and then you have great success in getting rid of it. I also had an opportunity uh, a friend of mine's brother had AIDS and he's on just loads of medication he was uh, sleeping 18 hours a day on the medication and she asked me is there anything you could do for him and I said I've never treated an AIDS uh, patient but I've already formulated in my mind if someone asked me what I would do for them and suggest that they do if I were asked and I said would you like to me to talk to him and we could try it and she said yes so I went over to the house and the man was barely awake the whole time we were talking but the girl was there and I told them exactly what they should do and I said um, you know I've never done this before and I want you to know this is a trial but I feel it's going to work from everything I've read and everything I've compiled well, uh, he immediately went on what the different juices and supplements and so forth. It took them a couple days to gather everything together, but he started. And um, the first day, he stayed awake all day long, which he hadn't done in months. The second day, he took a walk for two miles. The third day, he went out and started chopping wood for them. And she just said, I don't know what's in the stuff that you're giving him. But she said, this is absolutely amazing. And in four weeks, he went back for another blood test. And it was an uh, HIV test. And when he took the test, it came back virus undetectable. So that was just in four weeks of taking this, um, the different herbs and so forth that cleaned out his system. And uh, he later, you know, did very well. He never went back to work because he had another little disability. But, um, you know, he did very well for several years. He had a heart attack later. Oh. But uh, because he was, I think he was in his late 40s, early 50s when he started this. But it was very interesting, you know, that was the start. And from that point on, I was able to modify, kept modifying, you know, the different regimens that I had and updating them as time went by and making them hopefully stronger and more effective as time went by as I learned more things. With the advent of the um, internet, of course, it opened up huge amounts of information to me because you could never compile in your own library all of the books and researches and studies, you know, that are done all over the world. And I was able to get studies that were done in India and Pakistan and South America, Canada, Germany, Switzerland. <coughs> 
and you know just start adding all this information together. As I worked with people over the years, especially with cancer, I've had to add more and more things because we're we're now in such a complicated chemical environment that we can't control, from the water, the air, and the foods that are highly contaminated. That you know you have to do a little bit more now than you'd have to do in Jethro Kloss's time, who wrote the book Back to Eden. You could get over cancer easily just by taking carrot juice and eating organic vegetables. Mm -hmm. Then with Max Gerson and his time, which a little bit later, and you're getting more chemicals added to the whole environment, he, he gave them carrot juice plus liver injections. Then you go a little bit farther and you know, other people have added the teas, like Rene Cassé who added the Essiac tea. And now you know, there's a whole list of things really you have to add to ensure that you get over it because you've got to detoxify all of these chemicals and take care of all the possible parasites. Every other country, that, uh, is, well I shouldn't say every other country, most countries, most underdeveloped countries as well as Europe, uh, treat people for parasites twice a year and we used to do it in this country up until about 1900. Well now, you know, you've got to teach people that they might possibly have parasites which is hard for a lot of people to believe because we have so many sanitary procedures we're taking antibacterial things and using antibacterial on the outside and hoping that the USDA is checking our foods for all of these things. It's just not true. So we have to go back and re-educate people just about parasites alone, let, al let alone all the other pathogens that they can have that can complicate all of these very serious diseases and compounding diseases that we have. So um, you know, that's a lot that I do is education and then I actually make up individualized regimens for people and each person is treated s totally separately. I don't have uh, mass formula but um, I do give guidelines for some treatments in my book that can get people started but they're not guaranteed. I, I like to have the personal touch because they may need something more than what's in the book alone. Do you have a copy of your book with you that you can show us? I do have it here someplace. Let's see. Hold on. Here it is. Right here. Is it showing up backwards on there? No, it's right <laughs> with me. It's fine. Read the title to us just to make sure. Okay. It's Natural Herbal Therapy and it's on Amazon by Lucinda Gibbs Robinson. And in it, it tells you how to go. It's on Tora's own. <laughs> It's Excuse on Torizone. Is that on Torizone as well? It is on Torizone. It is on Torizone. Oh, I should have said Torizone and not Amazon. <laughs> True. Um, I give you a step-by-step -step in a mo very motherly and sisterly way how to rebuild your health. And I start off with uh, telling about the only guarantee of health is by having faith-based obedience in Scripture. There are no guarantees outside of that. Now many people have been blessed with good health outside of that by the mercy of the Heavenly Father. But yeah, for a believer, yeah, you have to know that the, the only guarantee for good health is that told about in the book of Deuteronomy. And you know, we're told that if we follow all that He asks us to do, and if we live within His will, within His instructions, His commands, His statutes, His laws, and live that way in faith, that he will bless us with excellent health and of course part of that is eating and he tells us how to eat he also tells us how to dress he tells us how to treat people he tells us how to treat animals he tells us how to treat the earth in a, in, a, in, a, in a roundabout way because we're to treat it as an organic garden basically and we haven't done that uh, he tells us about how to worship him and he tells us uh, about the depths of our heart and how we're supposed to examine our heart in every way toward man and, and the great uh, Yahweh of heaven and how we're supposed to live in this life. And this whole body of guidelines he gives us is the path of righteousness. And righteousness only means doing what is right. And the right. only one who knows what is right is, is the great Yahweh of heaven, Yahuwah, and his son Yahushua or Yeshua. There's many debates on the names, but I, you know, 
I know that his name isn't Lord or God, it's, it's and Jesus. His, Jesus' mother never called him Jesus. She called him Yeshua or Yahushua. And you know, all of these things added together, they're a complete package deal, so to speak, of living in righteousness and in holiness. And he, he asked this of his true-hearted people. And they understand that, that it has to be an all-or-nothing total surrender and an all-or-nothing walk in living for him. And he outlines it very plainly in scripture and he tells us that if you do do it his way, there's blessings. If you decide to go contrary to that, whether you know of it or not, or whether you're aware of it or not, you're going to get cursings or the absence of blessings in some cases. So he enjoins us and of course Yeshua confirmed this many times in his teachings when he talked about man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father in heaven. He also said the scribes and Pharisees said Moses see all therefore they bid you do that observe and do. So that you know is very plain. He didn't uh, minimize what they were expounding from the actual Torah. He was uh, quite, quite um, obviously confirming it. And of course he said that the, the law was not done away with and that until heaven and earth pass, every jot and every tittle will still be in effect and heaven and earth hasn't passed yet. So we know that these beautiful instructions that he gave us to help us to not waste time and help us to not waste emotions and to help us to not have the devastation or, or the disappointments if we'll just follow him He'll bless us in every step. He says, when you go out and when you come in, you're going to be blessed. And I've experienced it. And I, I say that in great humility that he's always taken care of us. And my husband was sick at different times and couldn't work. And yet we still had everything we needed. And the ways it came in at times was just awe-inspiring to see how we were taken care of. You know, in spite of uh, sometimes a few setbacks, it always... He always took care of us. He always took care of our uh, sweet eight children. And uh, uh, this, this is just, I'm living this life now in great reflection a little bit, and yet I'm looking forward, too, to many great things and opportunities helping people. I want to be a, what's called a mother in Israel. I've had so many experiences in life and understand so many things that I just wish I could encapsulate and, and basically infuse into other people so that they could see that, you're missing so much if you don't live for the Heavenly Father. You're, you're, the fullness of life that you want, the peace, the joy, the, the breadth of understanding of who He is and how, he, how deeply He loves us and wants to interject Himself in our lives if we will just let Him. All of these wonderful things I want to teach now to younger women as well as the things that I teach about health, you know, and helping people as individuals. Mm. Well, I've gone on a long time here. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing, your story. It's wonderful. I'm just sitting here like awestruck and um, really enjoying it. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Thank the heaven the Father. It's a, it's a blessing to, to know you know, people think that the Old Testament is relegated to antiquity. And we don't, he says that in these words are your life. And life springs from them. And the abundance of life springs from them. And uh, it's so marvelous that there's an awakening. Many times I've prayed, Dear Heavenly Father, send out the Holy Spirit like a mist in a cloud throughout the whole earth so that everyone can have an opportunity to understand this because it's just so wonderful. Do you know that right now half of the people that have ever been born on earth are now alive? That's uh, a wonderful opportunity now we have for evangelism and for witnessing to what God is and how He loves us and how He's always ever watchful over us and wanting us to come to Him and to receive every good thing that he has in store for us. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. And things like what you're doing makes it available all over the world for people to understand it and to hear stories mm -hmm. of people who have experienced it and are encouraging others come along and see, taste and see that the, 
that the Heavenly Father is so good. Lucinda, about when, how long have you been, and I don't know, are you a naturopath or a homeopath, and how long have you been on, on such a walk? Well, I'm an herbalist. An herbalist. I call myself an herbalist because I, I, I don't go into many of the disciplines that a naturopath or homeopath do, okay? Uh, I want, my focus is on herbs and anything I feel is totally acceptable in the line of scriptural thinking and you know in this whole uh, field of natural healing there's some things that I really don't agree with because I don't see that there's any proof for them and I'll tell you a couple of them uh, I don't like a lot of the homeopathic preparations because some have uh, honeybee wings in them they have snake scales and other things that are biblically unclean and it to me some of them not every formula but some of the formulas border on witchcraft because we know these things are not to be used for medicine okay okay now another one that I I don't really believe in is acupuncture and I know some people get a lot of results from acupuncture but I don't believe in because there is no actual physical proof that acupuncture works so the it you know, I, I don't want to get in a debate actually with someone about it, but I'm very uh, leery of endorsing something that I can't prove. Mm -hmm. um, another one is uh, kinesiology, where they put something in your hand and if they say it makes your muscle weak, and it's called muscle te testing. There's no scientific proof for that. So, um, you know, I stay away from that. So that, that's just, I mean, there's other things too, but that, that'll just give you an idea. I stick with the herbs, the vitamins, the minerals, the essential oils, the juices. I uh, uh, stay also with light therapy, water therapy, heat therapy. Um, there's also color therapy. I haven't done it a lot. I've studied it, but I haven't had people really call on me. But there, there is some value in color therapy. Um, I do a lot with juice feasting, juice fasting, uh, blended meals, uh, teaching people how to prepare raw meals, although I don't believe that you have to eat all raw. I think that the, it, the more raw you eat, the better your health is going to be, and that's the raw organic fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains. And um, I don't eat a lot of meat myself, but I am a great supporter of Beyond Organic, which is a new company that Jordan Rubin has uh, come out with. And we didn't eat meat for years because we couldn't find kosher and organic, scripturally clean meat. And uh, I, I'm supporting it just because a lot of my clients want to eat meat, and I, you know, I want to make sure that if they're going to eat meat, they can find something that is good for them. And, and also dairy products that are uh, the grass-fed and green-fed. So um, I've been doing this. I, I started reading on this and started a great desire to learn a lot about this in 1972. In 19, and I, someone gave me a book on John Harvey Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium. And he, in, uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, had this 1,000-bed hospital that very few people know about in Battle Creek, Michigan, where he treated people with only natural means. And all of the very wealthy and rich people and very sick people of the time, like Thomas Edison, Wanamaker, and so many of your famous people that were entrepreneurs at that time went there to rejuvenate, like a, like we would call a health spa now, um, they went there and would partake of all of his his foods, and he had, he had um, uh, inside gardens that could be uh, illuminated by the sun in the in the winter, so people could have do garden viewing. He he was a Seventh Day Adventist, so he um, gave them spiritual counseling, as well as he gave them all organic foods water. He was, he was an inventor of, of many different types of, of the exercise equipment that's still being used in gyms. And um, his story just goes on and on alone. But I was so fascinated and I just wondered at that time, is there anyone doing this now? Since, you know, instead of looking to find drugs, how can we rebuild people's health? 
and um, I looked for colleges even while I was going to Cornell to see if I could find something and there were but it, the internet wasn't available down you know you couldn't find out about everything like you can now but I started reading books the next book I read was Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss which to me was just it was like finding a treasure chest in the middle of a desert mm -hmm. because it has so much information about herbal cures in particular and it's, it has to do a lot with North, and, uh, uh, North American herbs, which we were most concerned with, of course, at that time. So, and then from there, I just, you know, would read anything I could get my hands on. And uh, as I said before, with the advent of the uh, internet, then, you know, it just opened up a tremendous about, uh, amount of information. So, and I used with my children, my children were never vaccinated. Uh, they did get chicken pox for one day each at one point when someone came to our house who had just gotten over chicken pox. It was very mild and it's so funny I had eight children and about every half a day another one would come down with the chicken pox and it would last about a day. So we had chicken pox in our house for about four or five days but it was, you know, one would, it would last for about 24 hours with each one of them once it started. Um, they had excellent health all throughout you know, their, their youth and uh, we, I used uh, you know, herbs and different juices for them when I could. They just didn't get sick much to be very truthful and I was very thankful for that. But when they did get sick, you know, I would use the natural things for them. One time they all got a virus that lasted about, I'd say it lasted about three days and they had a fever. But we had just brought, my husband brought home some beautiful little finches, tropical finches, into the house. And they were born, these, these finches were hatched out in someone's house. And I thought it was interesting. And the finches were from a tropical climate. And I really wonder if that, those finches didn't bring that into the house. But they all recovered quite well. And, you know, we, it took a little while for them to recover. But... You know, another we had a couple broken arms and things like that, which I was I did not know how to set, so I had to take them to a doctor. <laughs> but you know, in general, they really didn't uh, get sick, and I attribute that to the blessings of the heavenly Father. But we also ate next to no sugar, mm -hmm. always ate whole grains, ate a lot of fruits and vegetables, ate a lot of beans and lentils and so forth, and and uh, they didn't, you know, my children never even tasted a McDonald's hamburger until they were like 18 years old and that was at their own choice, I didn't take them. And uh, so, you know, I was blessed in that way. So I had a lot of experience through that, just seeing that even a simple, even monotonous diet at times, we would eat beans and rice and, and vegetables and tomatoes and oranges and so forth and sometimes it would be repeated a lot. Still, a monotonous diet of natural foods is much better than a varied diet peppered with junk foods and empty foods. So we, you know, we learned that good lesson. You know that that's the way to to raise your children, and that's the way to that you know they could have really good health. I'm a real a proponent too of excellent prenatal uh, nutrition. Mm -hmm. Mothers do not realize you can. How you eat, just for those nine months, can predict so much of your child's behavior and health for the next 80 years if they live that long, or 90 years. And it's so very, very important to eat a varied diet of organic, simple foods uh, during pregnancy. And they shouldn't worry about weight gain if they're eating natural, organic foods because that child is just siphoning off of your body so much if you're not getting it so it's for you but it's also for that child to, to be able to have everything it needs to fully develop and for its brain to develop and I read the book um, Let's Have Healthy Children by Adele Davis before I had my first child and it was such a blessing and she pointed out she was a nutritionist and she pointed out all that you needed to have going into your body on a daily basis in order to form not a beautiful calm, um, high-functioning children and I was blessed with that and my children all had very high IQs and they were very calm, peaceful children, all of them. Even when they would have fun and you know be loud in the fun things but they didn't have you know the learning disabilities and all of these things it, it, by, because I was very careful to make sure 
with each pregnancy and I had eight I had 12 uh, excuse me I had eight children in 12 years so I was just pumping myself constantly with juices and vitamins and you know everything that I could to make sure that I was pumped up myself personally to take care of these children and to breastfeed and I was breastfeeding in between as well as to make sure that when I got pregnant again I would have a good reserve of nutrients so that that child could be very well formed their brain and their nervous system and so forth could be well formed so important and the girls today that are that are have been raised on basically non foods the sun drop the cakes the cookies the pretzels the junk food the greasy foods and so forth they don't have much reserve for themselves let alone for a child that they may start making in their body very important to understand this and to me it, it, it saves so much heartache later because when the children are born with deformities and allergies and different weaknesses a lot of it has to do with what the mother put in her body when they were pregnant so you can eliminate a lot of these things if you're just very diligent and consistent when you're pregnant you're taking in all of these uh, good nutrients in a natural form wonderful I have a few questions for you I've been trying to write down while I go <laughs> what sure. are your um, thoughts on vitamins and things because I know that some people who are um, into natural foods and whole foods um, say that you should be getting it all from the actual food and not taking a vitamin what are your thoughts on, on vitamins well most people that we know in the United States, for instance, and in most of your industrialized countries are deficient in something. And it's you know because of like this, we've talked this very complicated chemical environment we have right now. At the, the, the best way to get your vitamins and minerals is through natural organic foods, definitely. Some people are so depleted that sometimes temporarily they have to take something else, which would be a supplement but I think it should be an organic natural based supplement also because you need the accompanying uh, nutrients for certain um, for every actually nutrient to be uh, absorbed for instance say you, your calcium levels are low your blood calcium levels are low if you just take calcium you're not going to raise your blood calcium levels you need vitamin D boron uh, magnesium and calcium in order for calcium to be properly absorbed so you're going to get that in a natural form if you uh, are using a um, organic milk or, or if you're taking organic greens you're going to get that all together so it's very important to get them from natural sources also you can juice which uh, breaks open the cells and allows you to get more of the nutrients that, that are in the foods that you're taking you actually get more out of that food if you had a pound of kale and ate it just steamed or you juiced a pound of kale, you're going to get much more nutrition out of the juiced kale than you are the steam because you've broken up so many of the cells and released the nutrients out of it. Also if you do blended meals, which means that you're sticking in the blender several things with some water and just blending the smithereens out of it for about a minute and a half, that also breaks open all the cells and releases them into the liquid so that your body can take them in instantly. So, you know, there are ways that you can deal with deficiencies if you don't want to take the, the prepared vitamins and minerals. Yeah. And it takes a little time to fill in those deficiencies, but if you're taking an, uh, an organic foods diet, it really doesn't take that long. You can really notice a difference in two or three days if you're very diligent and you'll build after about the third day. And I've had many people that were desperately sick go on one of my regimens and they told me by the third day that they've never felt as strong or as put together and whole mm -hmm. as they have that day when, you know, that third day when they've been taking things for three days. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you can turn it around yeah. relatively quickly. I don't think that you should use the synthetic. A lot of the synthetic are mirror images of the original. In other words, there's vitamin E, for instance. You've got D alpha vitamin E and then you've got DL alpha vitamin E this is D alpha this is DL alpha there it, it's if you had keys like that you couldn't fit keys in the ignition of your car that are mirror images so you've got to get the natural form is uh, if you're going to take a supplement it's very important and as I said the accompanying nutrients yeah. Wonderful. 
Um, what are your thoughts on fluoride in water or toothpaste or anything like fluoride in general? Because I know that can be quite a controversial topic. Um, I know Phyllis and I have talked about it before in uh, some of the shows. What are your thoughts about that? Well, fluoride in a pure form is a poison. We, we have, I mean, we know this. Hitler used it, you know. <laughs> um, it's a, it's not necessary for, it, it, it's tutored by um, dentists that you need it for the calcium deposition. And you need such minute amounts of it that you will naturally get in foods and water that you do not need supplementation. I'm a, I'm definitely an opponent of any supplementation of fluoride because it uh, it's, can be cumulative. The other thing it does that's really dangerous is if um, the chemtrails that are going overhead now are dropping bits of aluminum and in, in as the aluminum gets into the groundwater and, and the, you're pumping up that groundwater okay to drink and you're mixing it with fluoride. Aluminum fluoride is a terrible poison mm. that's now forming in our groundwater. And it basically makes you a very dull, dumb person. It, it, it decreases brain function. Mm. And uh, if you ever have those days where you feel a little bit more dull than others, now you know why. Mm. Because you're being exposed to all of this aluminum plus the fluoride that forms this compound. Um, you don't need it in toothpaste. A friend of mine, Ira Michelson, who's a Messianic rabbi down in Florida, said he went to a store and he saw that they now have little bottles like Pedialyte filled with uh, a solution for children to drink with fluoride. And he said he was just so upset when he saw it. He said they're even poisoning the children through sugary drinks now. It, not that the sugary drinks aren't already poisoning them, but they're putting the fluoride itself into the children's drinks. It's so serious. The thing is that if you want to prevent tooth decay, we know it has to do with sucrose and with several simple sugars. And you know, eliminate those from your diet. Go with the natural sugars in dates, in honey, in raisins, in uh, you know, stevia, and so forth. And and brush very vigorously with salt or with some natural tooth powder that will remove that and if you do that you will not get dental caries and that's you know what we're aiming for we also know that if people would eat more organic butter that that helps to uh, deposit calcium onto your teeth even if you have a dental carie started so uh, most people think, oh, you can't get rid of your cavities. Actually, you can get rid of your cavities. We know that if you use the organic butter, and you can even add cod liver oil occasionally to that, the combination of those two things can actually cause your body to redeposit calcium on your teeth in the damaged areas. Turnip green juice also is known to uh, reverse dental caries. So, you know, you don't have to have these things. You can, you can, uh, you can eliminate them. And uh, you're, the other thing is that a lot of the water systems, um, municipal water systems, have the Floyd in it. And the way that you get rid of that is you filter your water in some way. And there's so many different mm -hmm. ways. But there's cheap ways and there's very expensive ways. You can get whole house systems as well as some pitchers that uh, you know filter out the chlorine and the fluoride and other things so uh, it's important to have a very pure water system again to, to get rid of the fluoride as much as possible um what are your thoughts on raw dairy like raw milk and raw um butter and stuff because you're talking about the organic butter and stuff and i know that's a big movement the raw so. yeah well, we know that for years probably thousands of years people ate the raw dairy so can't say it's bad. I do feel though that because it, it depends on what the animal is fed. It we can, used to have goats, so I know about this, and we we would drink the goat's milk, and we gave goat's milk away to other people. It's it all has the health of the milk has to do with many different things. It has to do with what the actual animal eats itself. It has to do the, with the cleanliness of its stall and its surroundings. Mm -hmm has to do with the cleanliness of the milking technique and it has to do with instant refrigeration. We used to milk our 
goats on ice. In other words, we had a bucket of ice, we would milk it, the milk would fall down on ice and we'd immediately take it into the house and refrigerate it. We never had any spoilage or any milk go bad, except for if it was in the refrigerator for seven or eight days, you know, in which it would naturally do that anyhow. So, you know, if, you're, if you decide to eat the raw dairy, you have to make sure that all of these conditions are met because that will be for your health. Okay. Um, the other thing is that the animals come from different herds and then you bring it on your property or if someone else is bringing it on their property, you know, furnishing milk for you. I would make sure that the animals are, you know, had been properly fed and, um, you know, watch for vaccinations and so forth, you know, because if they were vaccinated and you can't help that because it was a generation before the animal you're actually dealing with, if you put an animal out into a green pasture that has many different types of um, foliage, um, the, it will cleanse it, it out eventually in a month or two, you know, maybe six weeks. It'll you know, help balance its own body. But, you know, I would watch that too. It's, you know, all these things have to be taken into consideration. And, you know, I wouldn't trust everyone. I'd, if you decide you want to purchase raw dairy from someone, I'd actually go to the place and see what they do and watch them, how they handle it. It's your health. You need to know these things. Yeah. Uh, Beyond Organic, again, is another one that has some raw uh, dairy that's, you know, very well taken care of. And it, 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 people can get it if they can't get it locally. They can get it through there. Unfortunately, Beyond Organic don't come to Australia. I, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> but, but I imagine you have many people that have individual homesteads and farmsteads that are providing, you know, the, the grass-fed or green-fed, uncontaminated dairy products uh, for individuals. Mm -hmm. You may have different laws over there than we do, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Um, one more question that I have written down. Um, you were talking about uh, prenatal nutrition um, and how important that is. Um, what are your thoughts on going beyond, obviously that's important when the baby's in you, um, going beyond that um, to breastfeeding, isn't it, obviously nutrition's important then, is it as important as while, um, while, they're, while you're still pregnant? And um, then uh, your thoughts on extended breastfeeding, sorry I have to get all my questions out because I keep forgetting them, <laughs> these are all the same sort of thing, your thoughts on um, extended breastfeeding and um, also on, you were talking about juicing and juice fasts and food, what should a mother be eating while she's pregnant and breastfeeding? All right, well I'm a, definitely a very strong proponent of breastfeeding. It's the most natural food that the child can get. If the mother's eating very well, which she should, you almost have to eat more after the child is born than you do while you're, uh, while you're forming the child because the child is going to take off well over a thousand ca uh, calories a day off you, so you're going to have to add a thousand calories. And quite often if you breastfeed long enough, it pulls all that excess weight that you may have accumulated off you in the form of calories. It's very important to have, again, a very adequate diet for the mother while she's breastfeeding, drinking lots of fluids, as well as getting adequate protein, adequate calcium, and adequate everything. You know, a variety is what's good because all these micronutrients are in different foods, so you've got to switch it up and make sure that you're getting a variety of foods, you know, enough to take your needs and the baby's needs. Um, We've heard this for years, but it's more important than what people really understand. The breast milk has immune factors in it. And when you don't, when you skip breastfeeding your child, he, he or she actually misses some of these tremendous immune factors. Uh, there's probiotics and different uh, fat-soluble vitamins and so forth that, that are in the initial breast milk that comes the first two or three days. So important for the baby's health that they get this. It's like giving them their self immunizations right there and it protects them. As a matter of fact, they've even found out that the breast milk sometimes has probiotics that are not even in the mother's digestive tract, which I think is so very interesting and I'm wondering if the actual breast produces those probiotics or what. But uh, we know there's over 300 different probiotics that, that 
dwell even in the mouth at different times. And uh, there's so many that we need for, to fight so many different types of pathogens, but bacteria in particular, that you know, it's very important that the child get this right from day one. So that's very important. Um, I think part of the function of breast milk, I mean, it's not just the feeding, it's the closeness, it's the bonding, it's the child learning to look right into the mother's eyes and listen to the mother while she's uh, feeding him and talking to him. And it just parallels to me so much the relationship that we have with the Heavenly Father, that he wants us to feed on his word while looking into his face and looking to him for comfort, looking to him for protection. It's just such a terrific par parallel. Um, slowly the child's going to want to eat more <laughs> and you know you're going to introduce some very healthy simple plain organic foods in the form of fruits and vegetables and and some gluten-free grains it's really smart to start with the gluten-free grains so that the child doesn't develop um, intolerances to different grains and you go on from there now you asked about uh, juices and uh, I think it's really important. I drank carrot juice throughout my pregnancies and I would add other juices from time to time. But carrot juice, the molecule in carrot juice is very close to human blood in chemical nature. So uh, there's some relationship there that's so good and, and, and can help form the baby and it is very high in calcium and vitamin E. It helps with skin issues, helps with nerve issues, helps with bone, bone and teeth formation. Um, you know, the skull has to form properly so that the brain can expand to its fullest potential. That's, that alone is so important for the development of a child. So, you know, these juices and the, uh, the blended meals make the, the nutrients so much more available to the, um, to the mother. Now, I also gave my children, after they were about six months old, I started giving them bottles of carrot juice and you know, different juices. I stayed more with the vegetable juices than the, the, the sweet juices. But I didn't, you know, I didn't withhold from my children sweet things. I just tried to make sure that they were in the natural form and whole form. Well, our candy was dates stuffed with nuts, for instance. And we used to make frozen banana ice cream, which was just, sometimes it was just the bananas in the blender with other fruits and maybe honey or something. Sometimes it was bananas and goat's milk. And, you know, got them used to eating these natural things. And even now, my children are in their 20s and 30s, and they still make really good choices. And they're, they're careful what they eat. They understand. And, th and their taste buds are acclimated to eating the natural foods. And that's what you want for your child, to be acclimated to what is good. And uh, if you start out doing that from the beginning, it definitely helps. You know, that they'll make excellent choices uh, in life. Um, did I miss something that you no, asked? No, that was wonderful. <laughs> um, sorry, just as you were talking, I had some more questions. Um, <laughs> um, what are you, uh, I, I know that um, kefir is a big thing now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And there's another thing, um, a tea thing, all the cultured foods, you know, that um, right. people are doing now. What are your thoughts on those? Well, every... Uh, Every culture in the world that lives to be a hundred uses daily cultured and fermented foods. There's other things they do too, like they dance a lot, they laugh a lot, they walk a lot. Uh, they live usually an agrarian lifestyle. They have a lot of um, uh, communal celebrations, which we know the scripture enjoins us to have communal celebrations in the celebrating of the feasts. But um, getting back to the main point, uh, you can't live very long without eating cultured and fermented products or live long and live healthily long. And uh, the vitamins that you take in have to do with short-term health. They help you to deal with the different pathogens that pass through your community on cycles and help you to give resistance. Your minerals are what give you long-term health. 
In other words, when you die, you're, you're, the reason you're going to die most likely is that there's not enough cal calcium and magnesium able to get to your heart muscle. So we have to consider we need to take vitamins on a daily basis to give us the uh, immunity to short-term health. We have to take minerals for long-term health. Well, when you um, consider the fermented and the cultured products, the fermented pro uh, and cultured products help us to break down the minerals so that the minerals are in our body. So it deals with long-term health. So there's many forms of this. There's yogurt, there's kefir, Beyond Organic has a product called Amasi and Suero Beef that are excellent products. And you want to get not a lot, it's not so important to get great numbers of these. The, the, what you want is a great variety of these probiotics. Um, the more probiotics, the more forms of the probiotics you can get into your body, the better. Because each probiotic deals with different classes of pathogens. So you want to get in something that has 35 or 55 forms of probiotics. And as I you said, kefir is one that has, most kefirs have 8 to 10 forms of probiotics. Most yogurts have 1 to 6 forms of probiotics. Amasi has 33 forms of probiotics and some of Jordan Rubin's um, uh, probiotic formulas that are called raw probiotics, they have around 35 different types and those are available at health food stores. So I urge my clients to take something like that that has you know, a great number. Now the, 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 uh, the fermented products are things like sauerkraut and kimchi and so forth. These provide lactic acid, and what lactic acid does, it goes into your body, and it, it forms the, the fuel or the food for the probiotics, so that the probiotics can grow very rapidly. So you want to take those in on a daily basis, and my husband and I do this every day. We take some amasi every day. We take some uh, raw sauerkraut every day. We also take pomegranate juice every day. So we're going to start taking berry juice, which has a very high ORAC value, and uh, we take vitamin E and a B vitamin so that we don't get Alzheimer's. We don't want that. A B100 complex every day can push off Alzheimer's 10 to 20 years. So it's a very expensive way to you know make that prevention. Um, I take different herbal and, uh, and essential oils every day, depending on my need for that day. That's a could be a whole program in itself, just talking about essential oils, because they're, they're herbs in a very potent, instantly available form as medicine as well as nutrition, and they're very important. But the, the cultured and the fermented products are something we should consume on a daily basis, and it's very easy to do it if you just make it part of your routine. And how did you find the time for all this with eight children? <laughs> Well, I've got five and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to try and fit all this in. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I homeschooled my children, which took up part of the day. Mm -hmm. And I've told people the little story that a lot of times the only way I could educate myself was in the bathroom behind a closed <laughs> door <laughs> while I was accomplishing other things because, you know, it was a busy time. But I just, you know... You know, as you know, some people are driven sort of to be learn in certain subject areas. And I have always, always had magazines I always had to go through. And I still do. I have a stack. Let's see, where is it now? I just took it out in the living room and put it by my favorite reading chair. Five books that I'm, that I'm you know, going to start devouring. So, you know, it's just a, I just had to keep at it. And, you know, when you enjoy doing what you love to do, it seems to be easy and you find time for it and I guess that's what it was with me. I just uh, you know, enjoy learning all of this and putting it together and what's so marvelous is is that it all fits together so beautifully. You know, I, as I learn more and more, it's just making this beautiful puzzle more, more complete, more ornate. You know, it's just all of these wonderful things that the Heavenly Father has given us, you know, to contribute to our health. They're so delicious. They're so appealing, and they're so satisfying. You know, and and all of these natural things can work together without direct effects or side effects that we don't want. That's it's so beautiful too. You know, that he's made everything to work and fit together so wonderfully. Mm -hmm. What? Um, sorry, you go, Phyllis. 
My question oh, is no. going to seem to stop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. This okay. is kind of off the subject, but you know, the, the, our bad diet may be attributed to the fact that two out of three women come down with cancer in the U.S. and one out of two men come down with cancer. And I had a friend the other day that, well, she, I just found out the other day that she had uh, gone to the doctor and been diagnosed with breast cancer and she said, oh, that's okay, I'm going to take care of this myself and that on the natural way. And he just sat and laughed at her and she is improving. She's just, she yeah. is juice and blended diet and she's already improving I just you know I, and I think that can't the increased rate of cancer is due to our diet as well as all the things that we're being bombarded with you know electronically the cell phones and the radio waves and microwaves I think that is contributing as well yes well I have a friend I'll tell you two quick stories I have a friend and that always kept her cell phone right here in her bra and she and she did it for two or three years and she came to me about three months ago and she show, she said I want to show you something she took me in the bathroom she said she had two cancer spots exactly where the phone was laying constantly and people warned her do not leave that cell phone there and she's fighting for her life right now and she has not chosen to use natural things and you know it's going to be a miracle if she survives the treatments that she's going through then I, this just happened recently. I go to our local farmer's market and uh, a new man was there this last time who's an organic farmer and I always patronize, of course, there's four organic farmers at our farmer's market, although there's a lot of other people there selling things. I only go to the organic ones. And I struck up a conversation with him and I said, you know, I'm so glad that you're here and we need anything you can produce and so forth. And he said, I'd like to tell you my story. He said, I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I studied biochemical engineering. And when I graduated, I uh, went into research. And he said, I found out that there are now over 850 plastics that are in our environment and in our soil. And the plastics are all a, a fake estrogen form. And he said, and uh, I, I, in the minute he said that, now it clicked with me because I know that our pesticides and so forth are all estrogen fakers. And any time that you take estrogen fakers of any type into your body, you're setting yourself up for cancer. And he said, when I realized that and understood that these estrogen fakers in the forms of these just plastics. Now this doesn't have to do with the pesticides and all the other estrogen fakers we have. He said, I understood that if I really wanted to help people, he said, I thought my research would help people so that we could, uh, you know, contribute something to cancer. But he said, when I realized that, I, he said, I understood that the only way that I'm going to be able to help people be healthier is to go back and be an organic farmer. So he just basically threw away his whole degree. And his mother had a farm that where she has five acres. She organically um, farms asparagus for the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And um, he said, I just decided that I'm going to go back and be an organic farmer. And he said, I'm so happy. And he said, I know that really what I'm doing is really going to help people with their health. So. I thought that was just a beautiful, simple story of a man who was highly educated and he realized what needed to be done, even though he had been trained for four years probably to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. he, he, got, he got the whole picture, you know, when he actually got into the research. It, we are in a very complicated environment and the thing that is one of the most um, troubling things is these estrogen fakers. There's no doubt. Your pesticides, your herbicides, um, uh, there's other chemicals that are applied to foods it's from the t before the seed goes into the ground until the time that it actually is on your plate that are these estrogen fakers and each one contributes to the um, to the growth of cancer. You see in the whole line of events of cancer growth uh, there's an estrogen that causes the rapid growth of cells and when you have any chemical in your body that's very similar to this. It fits in a keyhole, basically, of action. Then it starts this uh, domino effect of, you know, different chemical reactions that causes this rapid growth 
of cancer cells and it's what we don't want and you know the only way you're going to try to pull yourself out of that is to try to eliminate as many things as you can you'll never be able to eliminate everything but your chances are so much greater and healthier if you try to eliminate as, um, as many of these things as you possibly can and constantly take things that flush things out of your body. But I understand that the standards for organic to be named organic has been set so low here in the States that you, you can't trust that what you're getting really is organic. Well, that's true because there's it's called industrial. What what the USDA organic sign is called industrial organic and there are a lot of uh, things that flaws in there that allow non-organic things and lower standards to be uh, allowed in there. Uh, we've urged Jordan Rubin to start his own stamp called the Beyond Organic Seal which would lead other farmers to join in, you know, that would bring higher standards and maybe in the future he will do that. Um, you know, you need to know where your food comes. I tell people as much as possible get the local foods because your local foods uh, haven't lost nutrition in travel. They, they are exposed to the same pathogens that have already passed through your community, which is, people don't even think about this, but when the flu and all of these different viruses pass through the whole community, it's not just going to the grocery stores, it's going to the fields, it's going to every place in the air. So when you're eating foods from those fields, you've got to realize they've been exposed to those same pathogens that you have from a farmer that's a mile down the road from you. When you bring food in from California, they've been exposed to other pathogens. Mm -hmm. So that when you bring that into your home, now you're exposing yourself to something that you don't already have an immunity to. So right. it really is healthier to buy local foods. And of course, there's all the other things to be considered with, you know, there's not as much gas used and, and you're supporting local farmers and all of these other things that go along with that. But health-wise, it really is better to buy the local foods. Wow. Um, sorry, I've got more questions. Um, uh, yeah, Superfoods like spirulina and, and things, what are your thoughts on those? Well, anyone who has to rapidly recover from anything should definitely incorporate some of these foods. I mean, there's so many good ones. There's, like you said, the spirulina, there's the chlorella, there's different forms of algae, there's, there's uh, many forms of kelp that are just very high. And then you've got your broccolis, your kale, there's a, you know, different greens called rape and rapini and broccolini and your turnip greens, your collard greens, any, you know, parsley, cilantro, all of those are just, you know, so nutrient dense at, at, at a very low calorie content. In other words, you're getting a lot of nutrients and you're not taking in a lot of calories that can add on weight. Definitely, you know, they should be incorporated. I eat a lot of them. And along with this is another thing that I've become interested in in the last year. I grow microgreens. And what microgreens are, they're different than sprouts. Uh, I, I'm an opponent of sprouts and I'll explain why in just a moment, but microgreens are, you just need two inches of soil, you put seeds in, and when the greens that grow up get about three to four inches high, you clip them off like you would wheat grass and you eat them and they're so nutrient dense and it's an instant, almost like an emergency food, you can grow it in two or three days if you don't have access to food and you have a fresh organic food you can grow in just a very small area in your house in in basically in a pan or in you know a dish of some kind you can grow them uh, I like the microgreens for many reasons they're very nutrient dense and I also like them uh, in, in superiority to sprouts now what we found out about sprouts that a lot of people don't know is that when you eat the whole sprout which is the shoot and then the root with the root hairs and if you look in a, in a basket of, of sprouts you know you've got that um, Dr. Virginia Livingston Wheeler in her research found out that the exact chemical that causes cancer growth which is a gonadotrophic hormone it's a form of estrogen is always at the tips of the root hairs and of the roots of these sprouts because those cells are growing very rapidly obviously to grow to try to absorb the nutrients out of the earth. 
So uh, she told back in 1979 that this uh, habit of people eating sprouts, especially when they're trying to recover from disease, is very counterproductive because you've got to eliminate as much of these this estrogen form as possible. But you still can have the same freshness of sprouts by eating what's called the microgreens, and that's just what grows above the dirt. So um, that's what I've become very interested in. I have four growing right now. I have sunflowers growing. I have done D-U-N-N-P's growing. I have chia seeds, and then I have just a mixture of some radish, different types of radish seeds growing. And I have them, now I have them outside. During the winter, I bring them in. But I just go out there every few days and cut some off. And, you know, I either juice them or I put them in my salad or I lightly stir fry them. And they're so delicious and so crisp and so fresh. And I know that nothing's contaminated them. I, you know, I've grown them myself. And um, they're just terrific. And it just, you know, I, I have four bowls about this big of dirt that are about this high. And they have about two inches of dirt. And that's all it takes. And watering frequently. And after, Where about, after they get about six inches high, they start to uh, lean over and you know, well, it's time to start some more. Where do you find the seeds? Uh, there's different websites as well as most health food stores carry sprouting seeds. It's the same as a sprouting seed except you're going to bury them, you know, uh, just under a, an eighth of an inch of dirt. So um, it's a lot of fun. And my grandchildren are always, you know, trying to see what grandma's, <laughs> what's grandma doing now? <laughs> you know, so it's sort of fun watching them grow. You mentioned broccolina, and, and that brings me to the thought of a lot of these. Isn't that a genetic, mm. genetically modified plant? Because I've never heard of broccolina before. I wondered that too. I'd heard that. Um, it, it's broccolini. It's from Italy. It's a, oh. uh, now from what I understand so far, it's a natural, you know, it's a natural vegetable. But it's just from another part of the world. So I didn't um, now I, I know they've taken cauliflower and broccoli and hybridized them. You know, there's different things that they've done. But this is called broccolini, and it's, it's it has a very a much more delicate taste mm. than broccoli, but it has a very similar nutrient content. It's very good. There's another one called rapini, which is a leaf and a broccoli type head to it. It's also delicious and just a very savory flavor to it. And of course. As I, I was uh, someplace and I was telling someone how I fix things and I said well I put onion and garlic and I put some seasoning and the, there was a person in the background said anything tastes better if you add onion and garlic to it and I said well if you feel that way about the greens then add the onion and garlic because uh, it really does give you a very complete uh, dish when you do that and just so nutritious and so satisfying. What do you think about some of these I, I, I've seen in the, the supermarkets some of these things where they've combined one type of fruit with another and, and these genetically modified organisms. Do you, what do you think about those besides well, being against the creator's will? Right. You know, Luther Burbank was the one that started combining different uh, fruits and vegetables together to, to grow different varieties. And the way he did it didn't genetically modify the um, the organism like we have today. The, I'm, you know, really genetically modified organisms are not real food. In other words, they're, they've done so many things to it to damage it that it's really not good for you. We know, for instance, genetically modified corn, if you continually eat it, you're going to destroy your digestive system eventually. So, you know, we, we know what, what is. Well, for instance, let's just take corn. Your, your organic label in the United States, they cannot have any genetically modified organisms if it's labeled USDA organic. So that we do, you know, as much as you can trust it, um, we do know that. So, uh, and they have to be tested very regularly. The, the ingredients have to be tested very regularly to make sure that no GMOs have crept in on it. I'm not sure about the things that Luther Burbank did where he actually hybridized different um, fruits and vegetables. The nutrient content didn't change too much. And you know, this does happen in nature that sometimes the pollen from one fruit or vegetable can combine by natural means with another and form another variety. So I'm not sure it's bad. It's when they're actually breeding 
breeding out qualities that concerns me because like for instance most of your tomatoes they look beautiful they have a beautiful color they can last on the shelf but as we know they don't have the sweet full robust taste that a natural heirloom tomato has and that concerns me is when they're breeding out characteristics that could really benefit you they were, we were commanded not to plant two uh, types of seeds in the same field just so that crossbreeding will happen you know you don't, you we're commanded not to breed two types of animals together don't plant two types of seed in the field and I think of course there's a, a lesson in that to teach us to keep the commandments and not do pagan things don't combine those things but I also I, I, I think it's for our health not to combine two seeds two types of plants mm -hmm. probably true in the long run more than what we understand at this point it's probably true Um, sorry, can I, are we, I just want to change the subject now. It's very interesting, but I'm just looking at this other stuff. I've still got a few more questions for you. Um, out of curiosity, I just wanted to ask about you, home birth seven of your children. Um, did you have a midwife present at your home birth? Uh, I did at some of them. Uh, my last birth was twins. And oh, wow. We and we were in an area where uh, we couldn't find a midwife and I told my husband that uh, I can do this and that he's going to help <laughs> which he did and we had a daughter that, that was nine years old that she, we had talked to her and it, you know she I said if you want to come in you can if you don't you, you don't have to and and uh, it worked out well but we did have midwives with a lot of uh, our births and it was a great experience I mean just it's the Heavenly Father always provided for us along the way in this thing and I learned so much and they were so good to me they entrusted me with a lot of information and directed me to a lot of information so that I became a lay midwife over time and I've helped uh, many people uh, it's really not legal that I do it but and I don't tell many people about it but I've had some wonderful experiences helping other people have their babies at home and it's one of the most joyful things that I've ever participated in in my life. And uh, I uh, was very fortunate to have, sometimes problems would come up even in my own pregnancies or just before I wanted to have it at home, but we would pray and ask the Heavenly Father just to help us and things would work out. You know, it was just a lesson in faith all through the whole thing. And I always felt I wasn't sick. You go to the hospital if you're sick. Pregnancy is a sign of health. And why should I expose myself to everything at the hospital? And I happen to be sort of a modest, I don't know, a little bit shy person. And I just didn't really want to expose myself to everything at the hospital and be exposed. So uh, fortunately, we were able to find people. And fortunately, my husband was in favor of it. <laughs> I did educate myself, though, a lot. I would, didn't go into it blindly. I, I really wanted to learn a lot. I read many books before even my first child was born at home to make sure that I was, you know, intelligently prepared for possibilities. And, and uh, I have a quite an interesting story about our, when our twins were born. I never went to a doctor the whole time and I felt that I had enough information up to that point that I didn't really need to go to a doctor unless there was something happening to me that I didn't quite understand. And I never knew I had twins, but before I got pregnant, I prayed for twin baby girls. So I was a uh, several months pregnant and uh, I didn't know if I had twins or not but we lived in New York City area in Elizabeth New Jersey and the houses there there's only a driveway between the houses there's no grass or anything it's just the width of a driveway the man next door went out of his house and slammed the door one day when I was in one of the rooms at our house and I felt eight things jump in my body and I said to my husband you know, the baby just jumped, but I said, that wasn't two legs and two arms. I said, it was four legs and four arms. I said, I have twins. And I was, you know, shocked and rejoicing because I really knew I had twins. Well, the pregnancy, you know, went on and, and I was uh, getting huge and people would come up to me on the street and they'd say, you know, you're going to have twins, you realize. And I said, yeah, you know, I mean, I... It was just sort of interesting that people would observe me. I was, I was huge. I looked like a baby elephant. I mean, it was really huge. Well, the time came to have the babies, and and um, we had no midwife. We were at our home, and um, the 
the first baby. This is for women only. I mean, men can listen to this story, but this shows the power of the Father in Heaven because this is a miracle story that I'm going to tell you. The time came for the first baby to come. I'm at my home. We have, you know, a bed and we have sheets and we have uh, shower curtains and we have, you know, everything protected and so forth in the area that I'm going to have the baby. And this is just routine for me because I've already had all these babies at home anyhow. But but the first baby came out and she came out feet first and she got stuck inside of me. Her head and her arm was stuck inside of me and she would not come out and we couldn't get the cord from off around her neck. And we tried everything we had read in the books. Okay, so here my husband is squatting down on the floor by me who is squatting down on the floor. He's holding the baby's body up so that it doesn't damage the baby's neck. And he said, I'm going to pray. And he prayed and he said, Heavenly Father, you know, we don't know what to do. And we ask that you would help us. And he finished the prayer. And when he finished the prayer, the thought came to me, squat down as low as you can and push hard as you can one time. And I did that and she came out. Now we've got her there in our hands and she's purple. She, her eyes are not open. She's not moving. She's not breathing. And we did everything we th read in the books to get her uh, awake. For about a minute and a half, we tried everything. And my husband said to me, she's dead. And I said, not if she's attached to me, she's not. And I just had that faith that the Heavenly Father wouldn't have brought me this far, answered my prayer to have twins and to have her dead. Well, we prayed again. And he's holding the baby in his hands, and she's not moving, she's not breathing, she's purple. I mean, she's just like comatose, basically. And he said, Heavenly Father, we don't know once again what to do. We've tried everything, and we're asking you to give us wisdom. And he took her in his hands, and he gently hit her back, like she's giving her somewhat of a chiropractic adjustment. And he also twisted her spine, like her shoulders one way, her hips the other way. And when she did, she took a breath. And it was, I mean, the tension and the emotion that was in that room was absolutely unbelievable at that point. So, you know, he suctioned her and you, my daughter had come in. She was now holding the baby who was breathing, who was turning pink and so forth. And... And while this is going on, I'm forgetting that maybe I have another baby in there. And all of a sudden, on my stomach, I saw a foot push out. And it was so, you could see the foot so plainly. And I said to my husband, David, there really is another baby in there. Well, <clears throat> the other baby came yeah. out just fine. And she came out. Matter of fact, my husband put his hands down to catch her when I pushed. And she came out so fast she fell onto the blankets and you know the padding that we had on the floor I mean she didn't damage her because it was really it was about three or four inches thick of padding but she came out but with that came little pancake size of blood clots and they just piled on top of one another and my husband said to me you're bleeding internally and I said I must be and what happened is my eyes went blank like a uh, a snowy television screen. I was in shock. I didn't know it at the time, but my husband told me. I said, David, I want to tell you something, and I didn't want him to get excited. I said, I can't see anymore. I said, all I see is a snowy television station, like a snowy television screen. And I said, I can't, I have no depth perception. When someone comes near, I can't see them. And it, it would clear up a little bit sometimes. He said, You lay down. Well, a friend was coming over, and she was going to help us with the birth, and, and I told her, I want carrot juice and a can of salmon as fast as you can give it to me. I said, because there's something not right. So she basically fed me like an invalid, and in about three hours, my vision started coming back. But I knew, like my daughter says, who's now an emergency room uh, nurse, mother, you needed a blood transfusion. That's all you needed. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but... The Heavenly Father took care of me and brought me through it. And it was a very tense, emotional, and uh, beautiful situation. But I look back at it now, it was very dangerous, both for the little girl that maybe, you know, maybe she was dead. I don't know. Maybe she just needed to clear her passageway, her airway, and, ne and needed a neck adjustment. I don't know. But it was also very dangerous for me. But he still saw us through it. And 
we're both very healthy, very doing very well. So that's one of my that's miracle experiences I feel I went through and praise the Heavenly Father, we're all both okay. Um, one quick point uh, that I would like to also ask you about is, um, I think you mentioned it earlier, and I see it here written in your um, biography um, that you that you have studied the history of dress and and, and dressing from a, a scriptural perspective. Could you fill us in on that a little bit more? Oh yes, I've written a book called Cross Dressing for Christians. That's available, uh, and. Uh, at one point, my husband and I, my husband was in the ministry for several years and then he stopped the ministry. But while he was in the ministry, a question came up about girl, ladies wearing pants, ladies wearing bathing suits, is it holy, is it right, and you know, different things about dress. And you know, in some churches it's a big contention, in other churches they have very strict rules about certain things about dress. And I really wanted to know myself personally what the truth was on this, you know, what, what were the guidelines. So we, you know, read different information on it. And we lived in Brooklyn, New York at the time. And uh, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, downtown, there's a li huge library. And next to the library is a fashion institute. So the library has de dedicated one whole room in this public library to books on the history of dress. So we decided to go over there uh, on a couple occasions and go through some of the books that were there and we brought some home of course and, and studied the history of dress because I wanted to know, you know what was the original dress, what would um, Yahweh have us to, how would he have us to dress, what's acceptable and, and maybe what's not acceptable to him. So, so in our study you know we, we learned many things and of course if you go just straight by the scripture uh, we learned that um, he gave both Adam and Eve robes, basically, to wear. They were made out of a natural fabric. It wasn't fabric, it was animal skins, but it was a, a natural source. Um, uh, through time, these uh, tunics that they wore, which were like coats or tunics, um, they were differentiated in some way. And from what we can gather from the different... Um, artifacts that have been left that show people dressed is that the men's tunics remained a little bit below the knees but the women's always remained much longer uh, than the men's and of course then there came the women or ornamented theirs more than the men and so forth the next thing that we hear about dress in scripture is that um, the men that are in the in the ministry and the Levite ministry were commanded to wear breeches which was a bifurcated garment that wrapped around their legs um, when they were serving in the temple they were so, in the tabernacle they were supposed to wear these so that if they went up any steps no one could look up their tunic and see uh, the private parts of their body it was never given that women should wear these it was only give the permission to wear these was only given to men and as we follow the Judeo-Christian stream uh, through time, there was always this differentiation of dress where the, both men and women wore a tunic type thing, but only the men wore a pant-like thing underneath the tunic. And the longness of the woman's tunic uh, covered the area that the pant-like thing would. And, and as we continue you know through history I tell about it in my book I sort of go through it step by step and show that different cultures picked up the dress that it, some went of course away from the laws and the lifestyle of, the, of righteousness that the Heavenly Father had um, prescribed for mankind through uh, Moses but others you know, adhere to it quite well and we see that this same type of dress for instance for the men continued on with the Russian Cossacks and with those in Mongolia and with those in India and so forth and even in some of the Arab countries the men still wear tunics you'll notice some of the rulers in the Arabic countries still wear the long long tunics and they may put a business uh, jacket on top of it but they'll still wear that because that's their traditional dress well the <clears throat> the time of the division you know, for when women started wearing uh, what what the scripture calls men's clothing, 
came in about the 1800s and up until that time from the time of Yeshua till the time of the, about the middle 1800s women still wore what was called a dress in other words it got tighter in different areas it had different detailing different styling but it was still always a dress and it still always went nearly to the floor uh, and it never changed the men basically wore robes for a long time but then they developed you know these um, pantaloon type things that they wore in the middle ages where they were tight around the waist very full in the leg area and then tight at the knee or below the knee which you see in a lot of the uh, medieval type paintings and so forth you, know, you can see this type of thing at the court in France and England as well as the common people now we come to about the 1850s and um, the first time that a woman is ever photographed with pants as an outer garment. Now we don't know always what the women wore underneath their long skirts. We know that they had petticoats, we know they had sort of like, you know, the pictures you see of little Bo Peep with these little pantaloons or pantalette type things. So we know that sometimes they wore some type of an undergarment. but. Because everything was very private and discreet back then, a lot of it we don't know because it was never seen. But certainly we do know that women never wore pants or this um, bifurcated garment on the outside till uh, the late 1800s. And the first time that a woman was photographed in pants as an outward garment was in around 1850, and it was in a fashion card, which they have the magazines then, they had cards that they would hand out of fashions in Paris, and that was the first time. And it progressed from this, different things. The reason, the, the and still, most women rejected it, to be truthful with you. The first time that we see men wearing pants as an outward garment, which actually happened when Attila the Hun went across the plains in in Europe, you know, on these pillaging raids, they had robes and they split the robes in half, enveloped the robes around their legs so that they could get on and off horses in their horrific raids that they were doing. So that's the first um, evidence that we have of men allowing even their limbs to be individually exposed. Okay? So then we go to, to uh, now we're in the 1900s, the early 1900s, late 1800s, 1900s. And the reason women wear pants now, most people do not realize, stems from Coco Chanel. And if you've seen the movie about Coco Chanel that's out now, they tell the story exactly accurate to exactly what she did. And I'm surprised they did it, but they did. Coco Chanel was a hat maker, and she's a very poor person. She wanted to be famous. She wanted to be rich, she lived a very lascivious and um, unbounded lifestyle in France when she was young and she became a gifted hat maker and she wanted to do more, she wanted to really be a fashion designer and there weren't very many fashion designers, she was one of the first uh, worldwide known fashion designers and the story is told in her, her biography and it's also told in the movie and it's told exactly the same. She went to a fishing village, village in France. She saw the men in the fishing village and she went and bought men's clothes she, and she wore them on the streets of Paris. And they had the broad stripes, the pants, the jacket type things that these fishermen wore. And she started making these clothes in her fashion shop and selling them. She sold very few of them. But at that time, fashion magazines started being produced that went all over the world. And pictures of her fashions were one of many designers that were shown. And this broadcast it through the whole world. And she was saying that people were wearing them when they weren't really wearing them that much. Women were still holding to their traditional dress. Now, now. That's where yeah. pants, as women wearing pants as an outward yeah. garment was exposed to the whole world. And it was somewhat yeah. encouraged. Now we're going to go yeah. back to what the scripture says, where there in Deuteronomy, where it says, A woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Now, when we talk about 
cross-dressers in our society that a cross-dressing man is a man that puts on women's clothes. When we talk when about we, a cross-dressing woman, we don't really talk about it because how are we going to define when a woman is cross-dressing when she's been wearing pants for a hundred yeah. years? But the real but the fact is that yeah. pants were never a woman's garment as an outward garment. They, a woman's yeah. body was all, always um, enveloped completely in fabric so that her limbs did not show. And, I mean, in the book I go into it, I mean, there's so many repercussions to, to exposing the limbs, health-wise, spiritual-wise, society-wise, and so forth. And we're so used to seeing the body exposed at this point because of the society. But if you know the whole background of how it affects the church, how it affects society, and so forth, um, it's very serious. So I'm a real proponent of women not wearing pants. And I give a lot more information in the book. I've just sort of given you a real quick, swift outline of the whole series of events. Even men in Europe wouldn't wear pants as an outward garment for years because they called them vulgar, because they knew that exposing the limbs aroused sexual thoughts. And um, you know, I, I also have a great burden for the men in our churches because they go to church and they go to their different services to have a time of peace and learning and I've had men tell me it's so distracting so discouraging to be in a church when a woman doesn't dress modestly or cover herself up I said because we're, we're visual oriented women don't realize how visual oriented men are and they want women to help them in the problems that they have with trying to maintain pure thoughts and one way that they can help the men and be loving toward the men is by covering themselves up. Now that that's one aspect. The other thing is the scripture does tell us and give us guidelines not to mix fibers and fabric. And I, you know, there's actual scientific evidence that when you mix fibers and fabric, it uh, it lowers the immunity and the immunity factors in in your health. There's something else that I just, in, in other words, 100% linen, 100% cotton, 100% bamboo, 100% hemp, and there's all these different fabrics now that we can get that are 100%. That's what you should strive for for your health. And again, there's in the book it tells the scientific evidence for it. There's something that came to my mind here recently about use. I use 100% polyester sometimes if I can't find anything else, or 100% acrylic. But I realized something about two months ago that I had never thought about that the Heavenly Father brought to my mind. That every pathogen has a charge to it. And all of your synthetic fibers also have a charge to them. And the pathogens can be attracted to the charge of the synthetic fabrics. So in other words, when you wear synthetic fabrics, you're drawing the pathogens towards you. And when I thought about that, I said, you see, there's even a benefit in eating the, or in using the, the natural fibers because they actually repel uh, charge-wise the pathogens. And um, it just was a sort of an aha moment that came to me one day that we should really strive to go back to the 100% uh, natural uh, fabrics and everything that we use on our body. And it's, you know, we know that there are health benefits to it. Linen itself is very healing to have next to the body. And we know that it gives off EMF, electromagnetic frequencies that actually help build the immunity of the body. And it's much higher than cotton or any other fabric, which is very interesting. That, uh, and the, the scripture does talk a lot about linen. And, uh, and in the New Jerusalem, it appears as though everyone's going to be clothed in linen. So that's interesting, too. That is interesting. Wow. Wow. That's all amazing. <laughs> I feel like we could just go on forever. Um, but we probably, for Mark's benefit in um, trying to get this on <laughs> onto YouTube, we probably should wrap it up now. Um, is there anything that you wanted to um, ask or add, um, Phyllis? Um, oh no, I'm, I'm fine. I, I've, yeah, I, I've got some things I think I want to get back with Lucinda later, but I'm fine for right now. It was nice meeting you, Lucinda. 
Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope that many people enjoy this, and I hope that uh, it's given them some information to propel them forward and upward. That's the whole point. You know, and, uh, I welcome. I have a website. If anyone would like to go to my website, it's www.naturalherbaltherapy.info. And uh, I'd love to hear from anyone. And uh, you know, hope you'll read my books. Contact me. I'm Natural Herbal Therapy at Gmail. If I can answer any questions for you, I'd love to do that. And you know, in conclusion, I, you know, I love to tell people: follow the scriptures. Do everything you can to correct your life and line up with the scriptures. The Heavenly Father wants to bless us, and He'll provide a wonderful, beautiful life for you if you're willing to do that. You just have to be willing to follow His instructions. And I urge you, with all expediency, to do it as soon as possible. Don't waste time in your life. Don't waste human effort. Let Him enter in and give you His, his impetus and His blessings and His correction and His direction. And you'll find that your life is very beautiful if you take the time to do that. It's the most important thing in life. As Yeshua said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Make it your first part. If you're 16 years old, start now. If you're 81, start now. It doesn't matter. Start. Start right now. I encourage you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, sister, for everything you've shared with us today. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, and I'm sure that there will, people will have questions or <laughs> something for you. You um, have opened up a lot of uh, areas for people and, and given a lot of information. It's wonderful. Um, and so, yeah, it's mind-blowing. <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, yeah, we'll, ha we'll definitely be in contact So, Thank you oh, I hope for so. watching. May the Heavenly yeah. Father be glorified in all of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I will, um, it's uh, 20 past 12 here at night, so I'm going <laughs> to head off. And I'm exhausted, so. <laughs> but it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Good night, and thank you. Good night. Have a wonderful day, sisters. <laughs> All right. See you, Amy. See you, Lucinda. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey. Hello. Hello. Did, did Hello we mess? I, I'm, I'm going to have to research and get her phone number. Why, why don't you talk to Lou for a minute? Sure. <laughs> hey. Good to see you guys. Hi. How you going? Hi. Thank you. You guys look great for 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, she gets up at 6. I get up at about 6.30. Oh, wow. That's good. Oh, boy. We have the new... Uh, Adam just... He was really slow this month. He got the new uh, DVD master for the last seminar. Oh, know. wonderful. Yeah, I watched yeah. that yesterday at work, brother. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. Well, this will oh. oh, was it? Was it okay? Good. I, I watched a little of it to see how it was doing, but... Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just try to explain to people, uh, you know, what's been going down, you know, and the uh, history is like, you know, they want to make history different. And, well, they really believe it's really the way it is, you know. But, uh, mm. I like the heretic slant, the way it was presented, the, the, the heretic focus, the brilliant. Well, that's <laughs> it. That's, in fact, uh, you know, all these years and many years of studying and stuff, the, uh, the worst thing that a person can do is call you a heretic if your belief system is just a little close. But you know, our, our belief system doesn't share much with Christianity except for the Messiah, you know, and all the things that they do are, come from paganism, you know.